This is two-pointed energetics. The first point is you need to be able to define the terms exothermic and endothermic and understand that chemical reactions are usually accompanied by heat changes. Then recall that standard conditions are 100 kilopascals and 298 Kelvin. Define the term standard enthalpy change, delta H. Construct a simple enthalpy level diagram. Define the standard enthalpy of combustion, formation and neutralisation, so delta HC, delta HF and delta HN. Recall experimental methods to determine enthalpy changes. Calculate enthalpy changes from experimental data using the equation Q equals MC delta T. Demonstrate an understanding of the principle of conservation of energy and define Hess's law. Construct enthalpy cycles using Hess's law. Calculate enthalpy changes indirectly using Hess's law. Define the term average bond enthalpy and calculate the enthalpy change of a reaction using average bond enthalpies. Calculate average bond enthalpies given the enthalpy changes of a reaction and explain why enthalpy changes of a reaction calculated using average bond enthalpies differ from those determined using Hess's law. So with chemical reactions, we, they can either release heat energy to their surroundings, which makes them exothermic, or heat energy can be transferred to them from the surroundings, which makes them endothermic. The amount of heat taken in or given out in a reaction varies with conditions. As reactions usually take place at atmospheric pressure, this leads to the definition of enthalpy, which is described as a heat change at constant pressure. It's important to note that you cannot measure the actual enthalpy of a substance. You can only measure an enthalpy change. So in order to compare enthalpy changes of various reactions, we must use standard conditions given as 100 kilopascals and 298 K. Enthalpy changes can be represented on enthalpy level diagrams as shown below. So we have the enthalpy on the y-axis and the progress of the reaction on the x-axis. We see we draw the reactants and the products on a line each. And then the progress of the reaction is shown by this line. The activation energy, Ea, is the amount of energy required for the reaction to start. And delta H is the overall change in the reaction. So we see here that the exothermic reaction, delta H, is negative and the endothermic reaction, delta H, is positive. So reactions need an input of energy to get them started because reactant bonds have to be broken before new bonds can form. So the energy required to do this is known as the activation energy of the reaction and is, re and is represented by Ea. So an endothermic reaction is one in which the enthalpy of the products is greater than the enthalpy of the reactants, and an exothermic reaction is one in which the enthalpy of the products is less than the enthalpy of the reactants. Exothermic enthalpy changes have a negative sign. Endothermic enthalpy changes have a positive sign. And there are a number of standard enthalpy changes which are encountered at GCE level. The standard enthalpy change, delta H, with the little subway sign at the top, is the change in heat energy at constant pressure. So. You need to know three of these. The first is the standard enthalpy change of formation, delta HF, and it's the change when one mole of a compound is formed from its elements under standard conditions. So two examples here. The first one is methane being formed from carbon and hydrogen, and the second is hydrochloric acid being formed from hydrogen and chlorine. And you'll note that in each case, it's one mole of the substance which is formed. You have to balance the equation accordingly. So the enthalpy change then of combustion, combustion delta HC, is when one mole of a substance is completely burnt in oxygen under standard conditions. And here you'll see that the ethanol here, there's just one mole of it. The third one is standard enthalpy change of neutralisation, delta HN, and this is when one mole of water is produced in a neutralisation reaction under standard conditions. And you'll see here in the balanced equation, there is the one mole of water.
So experimental methods to determine enthalpy changes. Calorimetry. Oops. Calorimetry is the experimental determination of enthalpy changes. So for example, to determine the enthalpy of combustion of a fuel, the heat evolved can be used to heat a known volume of water. Uh, looking at this apparatus, we have a copper can with the water inside the copper can. We have a burner underneath with the fuel, in this case ethanol, and then there's a thermometer in the water. So it says we cannot measure heat directly, but we can calculate it if we take the temperature, mass of the substance and the type of the substance into account. So the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Kelvin, which is the same as one degree C, is called the specific heat capacity and given the symbol C. So the value for water is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Kelvin, or 4.2 is sometimes used. And the amount of heat then is given by this equation. The heat is the mass of the water times the specific heat capacity times the temperature rise, or Q equals mc delta t. So this is converted to an enthalpy change by scaling to one mole of the fuel. So other enthalpy changes such as enthalpy of neutralization can be experimentally determined measuring the temperature of the reaction directly. Other enthalpy changes cannot be determined by experiment, but they can be determined indirectly by applying Hess's law. So Hess's law states that the enthalpy change for a reaction is independent of the route taken, provided the initial and final conditions are the same. It's an application of the principle of conservation of energy, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change from one form into another. So enthalpy changes can be calculated using a Hess's law cycle. And there are two common types. So the first one is using enthalpies of combustion. And the general cycle looks like this. So we have the elements and the products of the reaction and then the combustion products, usually carbon dioxide and water, are written underneath. The enthalpy change from the elements to the products is given the number here, delta H1. From the elements to the combustion products is delta H2, and from the products to the combustion products is delta H3. And what I like to do here is to draw an arrow on in the direction that you want to find the enthalpy change. So we want, in this case, delta H1. And to get that, we go from elements to products. And we assign these signs. So I'd say this one is positive and this one then is negative. And when we look at applying Hess's law here, we see that delta H1 is equal to delta H2, and you'll know it's positive, minus delta H3. So you need to look at the direction that these arrows are going for the, the sign that they're going to have. That will be clearer when we look at more examples. So we can also use enthalpies of formation. And in this case, we're going to use the reactants and then the combustion products, which are usually carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And here we have the elements because it's formation. So in this case, we're looking at delta H1 here, which is the enthalpy change for the overall reaction. Delta H2 is the formation of the reactants from the product. So it's going up in this case, and delta H3 is also going up from the elements to the combustion products. So in this case, I'm gonna draw on my big arrow again. We're looking at the reaction going in this direction. So anything which is following the direction of the arrow is positive. So in this case, delta H3 is positive, but delta H2 would be negative because we're going in the opposite direction. So applying Hess's law here, we can see delta H1 is minus delta H2 plus delta H3. So an example here, calculate the standard enthalpy change of the formation of methane given the following enthalpy changes of combustion. And you'll see that these have been written in on the cycle. So we have here the elements forming the compound and 
delta HF here, which is what we want to find the enthalpy of formation. And here then we have the combustion products and we're given these enthalpies of combustion. So when we look at these, if we put in this one for carbon to carbon dioxide, it is here, it's minus 394. For hydrogen going to oxygen, it's minus 286, but we have two moles here, so we multiply this by two. And then for the methane, um, it's minus 890. There's only one mole of methane, so we don't need to change that. So when we apply Hess's law, we're looking at going in this direction, my big arrow. So this is going to be negative. This is also going to be negative. But this one here is going to become positive because it's going in the opposite direction. So looking at the little sum here, we have the enthalpy of formation, which is what we wanted to find, is minus 394 plus 2 times minus 286 <coughs> minus minus 890, which is effectively plus 890, and that's giving us 76 as our total, 76 kilojoules per mole. So the enthalpy changes for reactions involving covalent molecules can be determined by considering bond enthalpies. These are defined as the energy required to break one mole of a given bond averaged over many compounds. So a chemical reaction can be viewed as breaking all of the reactant bonds to give separate atoms, followed by the forming of the products as the atoms recombine. And the enthalpy change for a reaction is given by delta H is the sum of the bond enthalpies of the reactants minus the bond enthalpies of the products. And this sign, this big, uh, oops, why did I do that? This is the Greek letter sigma, and it just means the summation. In other words, all of the bond energies added together. So the enthalpies calculated using bond enthalpies differ from those determined using Hess's law as bond enthalpy values are averaged across compounds containing one bond.